Okay, this is an interview with John Cavanaugh, the Ramada Inn, Watertown, New York, Wednesday, April 23rd, approximately 9, 10 a.m. The interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Oh, I was born September 18th, 1914, in Alex Bay. My name? Yes, please. John, John Cavanaugh with a K. JFK, I'm a survivor. <laughs> Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to going into the military service? Well, I went to high school. I graduated from high school in 32, and we had uh, two farms, about 400 acres and 80 cows, and I grew up on a farm by milking by hand and a pitchfork in my hand, and, that's what I, and there was nine children. I was the seventh one, mm -hmm. and we, you know, we had a great time growing up, and I'm when the, when the government took our farm near, near Philadelphia in Sterlingville, I went to work on the railroad in 1941 as a fireman. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was drafted in, in May of 43 to go in, in the service. Mm -hmm. And when I got in the service, they put me in transportation. They were getting together this battalion for transportation battalion for a railway. And, and all the members in the battalion were all experienced railroad people. Our officers were non-military. They were plain old workers that knew how to handle transportation, and uh, they, they weren't concerned about morning reveille and, and evening uh, retreat. They, we never had to do that very much. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go back a second. Uh, where were you uh, when you heard about Pearl Harbor, and what do you remember about that? Well, I was working on a railroad, and I remember I heard the report, but, you know, it, it didn't concern me too much. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, uh, the officers you had uh, were basically from civilian life, and, yes. and, but oh, they yes. had experience on railroads. Yes, all of them, yes. Okay, where did you do your basic training? <clears throat> well, in, uh, in New Orleans, let's see, we was in Camp Claiborne, the most of it. Between Camp Polk and Camp Caborn, it was about 40 or 50 miles, and they, we had a couple of engines there, and they, it was an experience like we were going to encounter, but we, we hauled stuff back and forth, and we had military training, too, and rifle and bivouac and so forth, so forth. Mm -hmm. But we weren't fighting people, but they did issue us carbines after we got over in and on the, on the engine, they'd give us a carbine for defense. Mm -hmm. But it didn't work very well because uh, with the cold dust and, and the dirty air, the gas-operated uh, carbine didn't always function. So they mm -hmm. took them away later and after a few months, and they gave us a nice Colt 45. And we had quite a time with learning about that, that thing. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I can tell you an experience I had later when, well, right after we got the darn thing, we, my friend, uh, he was an engineer too, and we, we were doing a little different. This is when the outfit got spread out pretty bad, and the French people were able to do their own railroading, so my friend, less, less, less hints, we were stationed at a depot where they were pumping gas and oil, all colored, colored troops, and uh, we, we ate with them, and we had a room with a lady, French lady, and I got pictures of the street, and you go in the door, and, and you go in, and one side was the cattle and the horses, and you go this way, it was a home and the bedroom right in the same door. Huh. It all smelled like the barn, but that was all right. <laughs> anyway, this, getting back to this Colt 45, we sat in a bedroom like this, and he had a bunk, and I had a bunk, and I'm sitting on his footlocker, and he's sitting on my footlocker, like right there, and I hear, and he's got the 45, and he said, gee, let's see, it's got a safety here, and there's a safety here, and there's a safety here. And, and I, we were gabbing away, and bang, oh, it went off. And it was a terrible explosion in that house, and we never never stopped talking. We didn't let on, nothing happened. But when I, when I looked around, there was a hole right through his footlocker, right between my legs, and it screwed all his clothes. But I was okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> oh, that was so, that was amazing. So we got initiated to the 45. Mm -hmm. 
Um, how did you get over to Europe, and when did you go over? I went over about the third week of March from Boston and left there. In, in what year was that? That would be 44. Okay. And uh, in a little old Liberty ship. And uh, they made a lot of those kind of fast, and then we packed right full of our battalion. And we didn't go out very far before other ships joined us, and there was a flotilla of about 40 ships with all the Navy escort, and, mm -hmm. and we started going in. And uh, later, when we got over in the rough North Atlantic, they, they'd come over, the uh, speaker, look out for torpedo tracks on the starboard side, holy gee, and you're down, way down in the bottom of that damn thing, boy, it kind of gives you a funny feeling. And gee whiz, and they started dropping depth charges. Oh my God, they dropped off them depth charges. And when they went off, the old ship, oh, you'd think was going to come apart. But they got the submarine, and I, we watched them. They had a Navy d destroyer that had a seaplane on it, and they catapulted the, the plane, and they picked up the survivors. So we were glad that that was over. But the water was so rough. The waves were 30, 40 feet, and that ship went up and down like you couldn't believe. You'd be in your bunk, you'd be in the bunk, and that ship would drop and leave you right up in the air, right down. And that's the dumb truth. You sit on the fantail with your stiff knees, and that ship would drop, and, and you'd catch up with it in about a two inches. You'd drop right onto your feet. We go, we go down in the hold and the lobby to eat. You know what they call the galley to eat, mm -hmm. and we had to stand up to eat, and they went on trays on trays and the ship would rock and rock and everybody's tray would go that way and you'd watch it and grab your tray and you'd be eating pretty you'd go this way and oh my god talk about trying to eat and be seasick <laughs> oh my god so we went to glasgow landed up in glasgow and come over the highlands down to uh london then right east of london was andover and we ended up there in a little repo depot and slept in tents and they had some British en engines that we shunted the shipments into places they stockpiled. England was just a big arsenal ready to sink in the ocean with all the piled up stuff. And mm -hmm. Then after two or three weeks I went to Southampton. That would be early May down in the, on the coast mm -hmm. channel and where I worked between the old docks and the new docks hauling freight right through the city from 3 to 11. And then when the buzz bombs come over every night, oh, that was something. Every darn night, them buzz bombs would come over and the concussion would jar you right out of bed. How did you get along with the English people? Did you have much contact with them? Not really. I remember them, we had a few English soldiers working with us when they come four o'clock in the afternoon, right with the war going on, them buggers had stopped and got to have tea, you know. Mm -hmm. They're, they're going to have tea every day. And we're over there trying to save their butt and by God, they've got to have tea. And we didn't like that, but finally we got smart and we joined them. <laughs> <laughs> Gee whiz. Yeah, we had tea and tarts. There were little girls in the church someplace, they'd fix us tea and tarts, and they were glad to, and we were glad to have a little break, and that's it. Then uh, I was in Southampton, and, uh, and, and, and I, could see, I could sense the days was coming with all the action, and uh, I was there on the D-Day, June the 6th, when... Boy, and the planes were going over, and you couldn't believe them. Thousands of planes with gliders, and you couldn't imagine how they ever got them in the air at one time. So many planes going with gliders. And was it no time before the casualties were coming back, and the German prisoners were coming back right off the bat, and uh, we had to shuffle them out. And Then about four days, the 10th of... Um, 10th of June, we were on a barge and we went across to Utah Beach and went right in where they had the uh, invasion and saw the the wrecks of the, the war and the, the houses are still smoldering and the, the horses are dead and, 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 and legs sticking out stiff, how they blowed up in the cows and all the people that were there in, in shock, you know, four days after D-Day. And we slept in a little pup tents for about 10 days and and uh, in this country, if you you got to learn the railroad, you got to travel over, and you got to know every switch, you got to know every s signal, and anywhere you work, you know. But I, I I couldn't believe how they were going to get us acclimated to where we're going to work over there. But then, uh, I come, we had 50 train crews, 
50 crews in my outfit, Company, Company C, the 712th Railway Operating Battalion, and I was the engineer, and I had a fireman assigned to me, and Tommy Jarvis from Cincinnati, and uh, my turn to came in the middle of the night, about 25th, I got the same first train orders in that book that I got that day, and I got a map, I've got a map of the topographical uh, land in, uh, in, in metric figures of the grades, the hills, and the towns, and the villages that we're going to pass through. I got that. In the middle of the night, about the 25th of June, and, and no lights anywhere. There's not a light to be seen in the whole country. It's a complete blackout. If you see a light, you don't know how large it is, you don't know where it is, and it might be close by, it might be a mile away, you can't tell, it's a strange country. In the middle of the night, went to this depot, they took me there with my crew, and, and like a ghost, you could, you could feel the engine coming, you could smell it, you could hear it, you couldn't see it everything. It just comes up in front of you like a ghost, and the guys got off, and I have a flashlight, and there's no, no, no generator on the engine, no lights or nothing. And they get up on that engine with a handful of orders, and they say, go. What and kind of engine was it? It was a GI engine. It was something they took over. They had quite a few of them, a lot of them. Yeah. Did they have to do much repairing of the railroad tracks? Or? Oh, yes. Oh, uh -huh. yes. Now, they, were, they, were these uh, diesel engines or? Oh, steam engines. Steam. Yes, steam engines. Anyway, and uh, there's a guy going ahead of you, 20 minutes. And, and you're going to follow a guy in the dark that you would have no idea where the train goes. And I tell you, that's pretty scary. You're like you're blindfolded. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have a flashlight to watch the gauges in the water. You've got a little water thing that water's got to have is water. So you start, you start to go. You start to commence to begin to go. And you go out. And, and the guy ahead of you is going to the caboose on the train ahead of you. And you He's got a red lantern. If he stops, he's going to put a red lantern down, and you're going to what? You're going to see that red lantern, and that means you're going to stop. So you have no idea how many cars you got in the tonnage, and uh, you don't know whether the curves are this way, right or left, or hills. But anyway, you go out there and you keep put putting along, walking speed. This is the walking speed because all you can see is the shadows of the poles and the trees going by. Uh, this, in the corner of your eye, you watch the shadow, and, and you're looking all the time, and the fireman's got to keep a little fire going, and the fire door is right here, and he opens that and puts some coal in, and he's got to be looking, and it's pretty shaky. In the meantime, old George Patton's up there 25, 30 miles, and he's fighting away, and, uh, and uh, every once in a while, there's quite a little, you've seen the fireworks, and, and, you know, there's a lot of ammunition going on. Mm -hmm. So, you start going downhill and downhill, and you're going faster, and you're trying to slow up, and then things are going by you, and you don't want to crash into somebody, and you you get the thing slowed up a little bit. You get brakes and everything, you know, but it uh, seems like you get slowed up, and you're at the bottom of the hill. Holy gee, and then, you, you know, you're going to start plugging up a hill. Whew, it's scary as hell. And... A couple of times, you go up a hill a little ways, and the guy's stalled on the hill. This didn't happen the first night, but it, later, guy's stalled on a hill. He can't make it. So the, you cut off your engine, and you nose up on this guy ahead of you, and give him a little tug. They got these uh, Lincoln pin things. You'd hook them together and give him a little pull to know he's there, and then they uncouple that coupling, and you push, and you push, and you push, and you get them moving, and finally, you go a couple of miles and he's, he kind of, you ease off and he keeps going and you hope, you hope he's over the hill. So you go back and you look and look and look for your train in the dark, you left it back there, but we didn't have these caps like they had in this country that they'd put on the track that when you got near your train you'd hit the cap and you know you're ready to couple on, but we'd have to search for the cars we left. So we'd get caught onto them and pump up the air and release the brakes and we'd start to commence to pull and We'd go so far, and we're hung up, can't, can't go no more. So the guy behind me, he's got to cut off and give me a push over the hill. 
That's the way it was. One train after another, slow going along like a convoy. Uh -huh. yeah. Now, what did you mean by a cap? Was it like an explosive device? Yes, that was yeah, you? yeah. We we didn't have those at first, but later on we found some when we used them. I could tell you how, but uh, yeah. So that's the way it was. And then when it come daylight, we found out we had a carload of coal right behind the engine. Oh my God, a carload of coal because it's a coal burner. Uh -huh. And a few nights later, in the middle of the night, we're out of coal. No more coal in the coal tender, so we've got to get, get across from this, this load of coal and get up in it in the middle of the night with a scoop shovel, trying to shovel coal from the top of a box or a open car into the, into the tender. And in the middle of the night, in the rain, I don't know, I said, I, I don't know how I ever got mixed up with the damn railroad when you're at, oh my God, <laughs> rain and cold and trying to shovel. You could do more with your hands than you could a scoop. A scoop shovel, you can work it on a, on a deck, but mm -hmm. when you go down to the top of a, it was miserable. Well, we did it. But that didn't last long because in a few days, the German prisoners, they, they, they shoveled the stuff over. And then it was only a week or two when they had power clams to pick it up, you know, things are progressing, that mm -hmm. part. And then we had to get the water out of little cricks. They had a little mobile pump by the creek, and you'd put a little hose in the tank. And after you know, you're, you're going to have water and coal uh -huh. and run the engine. Uh -huh. So everybody'd have to stop and get the hose put in. It'd take a half an hour to fill up the tank. It doesn't like here. They'd have a stream going that big in our country, but over there they didn't have that. Only little. So we. How had, did you pump the water? Did you have some kind of? They had a you know they had a man tank to a little uh, motor. Mm -hmm. A motor, like a little generator, a little generator, uh -huh. pumping again. Okay. So, and though we 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 stop and go, stop and go, and then we just you'd be on the same engine four days and four nights going one way. <laughs> Imagine that, mm -hmm. sleep on it, cook on it. We take the shovel and clean it off and put it in the firebox and get it hot, you know, and put our put our ration on it and heat it and toast it and <laughs> take a bath. You go down on the ground and. Fix a couple of valves up there so the hot water, warm water is coming down and you're out in the country and you just strip off and didn't have no towel but we'd get washed up. Live on it, sleep on it. And then when the guy ahead of you is getting fixed up, and there might be two, three, four trays, they're getting coal and water. So we'd take a cap and put under the caboose of the guy ahead of us. So when he took off, it would wake us up and we could relax and have to be watching all the time and that was quite a help. So that's the way it was. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Long nights and long days. Then, uh, well, uh, you saw some of them pictures of the ammo. We had all kinds of stuff that we handled there. There's, we, remember I told Father LeBaff, you don't know what fright is. On this night, I had a train, all a big heavy ammo stuff, and the Germans knew we were out there. I guess it was German planes anyway. They were dropping them flares like you see in Camp Drum. They, they, they float away and we got, we'd stopped out in the country and, and all of a sudden this little plane was dropping them flares and there were Germans looking for this ammo train going to t touch it off. Boy, I thought, you can't run, you can't get away. What are you going to do? We couldn't open the firebox. We, you didn't dare to open the firebox because it would expose the, the light that they were looking for. So they got chased away after an hour or two, or come daylight, we're glad of that. But there's a picture of a German ammo train right there that uh, that got uh, hit by an RAF in that train. You'll see yeah. one of those pictures. Is it okay to fold this over? Yeah, sure that? enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you want to that hold right that up against you and I can I can That one in. right there. That middle one. If you hold this up in front of you. Oh, okay. Yeah. This one here. Yeah. That's a German ammo train that got hit and it just cleaned off. It cleaned the woods. They cleaned the trees right off the ground on both sides. You can see how it was cleaned mm -hmm. and that was an ammo train. That might might have happened to myself when, if, they, if they found us. Okay. I got that. Mm -hmm. So what else right. you carried uh, take that? ammunition on trains? What else did you carry? Oh, everything. My God, there was rations in KP and, and, and hospital trains. There were hospital trains with casualties. And prisoners and prisoners and trains of prisoners. 
and rations, and, and we had to clean up a lot of yards uh, that were up above. They, they would fix up the track so we could get the, get the what, what was left from the bombing. We had, I don't know, we was always hauling stuff. And later in the war, after a couple of months, there were so many people displaced, they had no place to go. They got to ride in the trains. You got pictures of people riding the trains. Every train just was covered with people riding right on top with all their belongings. And and every intersection of railroad, like a Watertown yard, there would be thousands of people day and night hanging around waiting for a train to go in the direction that they wanted to go, hoping that when they got there they would find relatives that had shelter and something. So every one of those for days and nights, every every terminal had it was awful mess here. I got pictures of what it was like around after people have no bathroom and all the soil and and, and, and no privacy. These people just stayed in the like box cars? Well no, they were they, they would move here or there. No, they didn't use the box cars. Mm -hmm. No. They just rode in them and sometimes they'd ride run right on top. Mm -hmm. I've got pictures of a Carloads of coal, and they're riding right on top with all their belongings, and little kids sick. Now, how come you were able to take so many photographs? Well, I had a camera with me all the time. Where did you get the cameras? Oh, I, I bought them in France, and I threw, I threw two away that the bellows got to leak on them. And, why don't you show us the camera that you have? Huh? Oh, show yeah. us the camera. Well, it's a, it's a German. It's got a good lens in it, and I don't know the name of it, but that's... Uh, it's a, it's a German camera, and uh, it, it folds right up, and and, uh, uh, and I carried it with me even when I was not the engine. And uh, I was I left a lot of pictures, but I sent home 350 and wrote on them all. I wrote on the back of it. Now, did one. you have any trouble finding film for that over there? Not really, but I did leave quite a few that when we move up every every month or two, we'd move up 102 miles, and I left some behind. But I salvaged a few. Yeah. Well then, um, we had our lighter moments too. But these Red Cross trains, you know, the hospital trains, I had a few of those. And there was no maintenance on the, on the equipment. They had nobody to care for the, the, <coughs> the brakes and things that needed attention. So it was really, you couldn't handle the equipment with a smooth ride. So. These hospital trains were just bunks in them with casualties riding along and they had uh, medical personnel to attend to them and they would come up and chew us out for rough handling but we just we just couldn't help it because the equipment wasn't very good to, to make a smooth ride. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never, I was glad I didn't get very many of those hospital trains. Yes, yes, yes. Now those hospital trains, uh, were they mostly? A glass of water. Thank you. Were they the people on the on board? Were they seriously wounded? Did, yes. did they do oh, yes. operations oh, on? Oh yes, they had them all. Yeah, the, the, the doctor, the, the the officers, they come up back and look at these poor guys. I, I didn't do it. I did see some of them, but mm -hmm. they were casualties. They were just like on the MASH program. You know, they were real casualties. Mm -hmm. God, on that D Day, you know, there was nine thousand killed. 9,000, over 9,000, and uh, and we had a lot of German prisoners, they would be riding along in open cars with a guard on every car, I had trained those and trained those of prisoners. And now where did you take them? I don't know, I, I never found out, they just took them someplace, but they would, they would, Patton would, would capture a whole bunch and they'd leave them surrounded and they'd be there two or three weeks you know somebody watching them that's the way the war went because there was pockets of, uh, of prisoners that they surrounded and left there. So you were mainly following Patton's third army? Yeah right Patton's mm -hmm. third army they moved up we moved up mm -hmm. and and I started in Normandy at Eberaches was my first train orders and then we worked around Paris. We were stationed outside of Paris for a couple of months, and we run in and out of Paris. There was a nice railroad there, and it was it was good signals and electricity. And we uh, wouldn't hang around there very long. Where we moved up to Bali Duke and over in other ways, and then by that time we had about 25 cars all put together that we slept right in the cars, railroad cars with bunks in them, and we had our own 
guys uh, cooking and everything, and it was okay. Did you always keep the same train, or did you switch? Yeah, they moved that up. They had it for quite a while, and then when we got up into Germany, we stayed in a high school, and had a, a builded it in a high school, and yes, yeah, so uh, I remember one time when the bridges got bombed out in France someplace, we had a detour. We had to go a, a back road from a about seven or eight miles to a different, there was a lot of railroad in France, just like a spider's web, they went all over. Mm -hmm. But this is a section of railroad, maybe eight or ten miles, was uh, an old railroad that hadn't been abandoned for years, and they just resurrected it and cut the trees and the brush, and we moved across there for a while. My first trip across that, we called it a detour, because they cut the trees and the brush right up to the end of the ties, but up in the cab, in the, uh, the cab window, there's an armrest where you look out, but the trees that were still right here, so damn close, you could hardly put your head out. Mm -hmm. Not all the way, but in some places, right through open country, and we'd be stopping and going. And and the French people, French girls and women, there's no men around. There's no men around France. They're all gone. They took them and they made slave laborers out of them. There was nobody to. But these girls would run across the field, and oh, they were so happy to see a Yankee train up in that train abandoned track, and they'd bring us flowers and ribbons and put on the engine, and they'd bring us cognac and wine, and holy gee, we were, we were, it was quite a celebration, and they were so happy, and we were too. Now, I, just, I said to my kids one time, if I'd had any more of that cognac, if that, if that, if that engine would fly, I would take off. <laughs> Now, uh, the gauge of the track, was that always the always, same? Always, always the same. Okay. We had the standard track like we had. Uh -huh. The Russian track is a little wider, seven or eight inches wider than ours. Okay. But I remember while well, we were doing this little deal across this detour, my, my fireman, Tommy Jarvis, these two girls came, they were 14 to 15 in long dresses, and they put flowers on it, and they had this little, this little uh, four or five ounce glass, of, of glass bottle, and it was amber colored, and gee, it, was, it was cognac, you know. So Tommy got it, and he thanked him, and, and he, he, gulped, he gulped it right down, and he kind of coughed and spit. And I said, what happened, Tom? My God, he said, it was perfume. Oh, <laughs> jeez. It was. It was funny. Oh, he thought it was cognac, it was perfume. <laughs> oh, dude. Uh, oh, yeah. Yes, right, dude. Well, let's see now. Um, yeah, when I was uh, near Paris, I made, f I went to, there was a public bath building, great big, nice old building. We'd go there for a bath. They had large tubs. I call them Napoleon tubs. My God, you could, f they were big, you'd get wide in and over 20 minutes, you could float around in that nice water. Well, we were going there when we could, and we met this bunch of kids that they wanted us to come, come home and see their parents. So we, I went to this family, and they're, they were a great family. And I, I made friends with them, and I stayed there over weekends sometimes, and I wrote to them after the war, and they sent me a lot of pictures, and we, we kept in contact. And uh, that was it. And uh, In fact, we knew everybody on the street, and I took a lot of pictures. And one of the girls married a guy from Oswego over here, and she, she, later she came over, and uh, I got pictures of her, and I hear from them. She and her mother came later. Every Christmas I'd hear from them, and they were out, and they moved out in California now, but uh, it was kind of nice to have them. Yes. So, um, so then I went, got over into France. I got maps of all the area that I covered over that different parts of this country, and I got up into Liège, Belgium, and in Luxembourg, which is a at that time, I was amazed to see the Woolworth store and, and Coca-Cola, and they spoke a lot of English way back then in Luxembourg. And then uh, I was over in that way one time, and I got up, went down in the Ruhr Valley, which was part of the industrial area of Germany. And there was a, there was a whole group of French men that had been slave laborers for years, and they were free to come home, and I had a train of the French civilian men, and, and the, it was 15, 20 boxcars, boxcars, and, and bringing them home, 
And boy, you talk about a happy bunch of guys. Oh my God, I tell you, I never, I, that was the highlight of my life. I was their savior. Oh, they come up and they hug me, they kiss me, and they all wanted to ride the engine. And they all want to get home so quick. And every time we stop, I God, they, they'd get up on the engine, they'd get out in front of the cab window, they'd get up on the front end, they'd get in the coal pile, they'd get all over. And I said, nope, I won't move. You, I can't see, and you guys, you know, I talk French. I had three years of French, so I got along pretty good, see. And I rebelled to move until they got off the engine and went back, you know. But they hugged me, and oh, I was their savior, and they were whole oh, happy to go home. Hadn't been home in years. Mm -hmm. That was quite a thing. Poor devils. Yes, indeed. Oh, God, yes. So then, after we got over into Germany, there's all the destruction and they fixed up the track, and we had a quite a long session. I was there during the, for the end of the war from Frankfurt. We got there by truck from Mains River. It was they, they went across the Mains River on a truck and a pontoon. But we, we got the power over there, and we started working between Frankfurt, Hanau, outside of Frankfurt, and Würzburg. And uh, the first time I went that trip was take four days and four nights, boy gosh. Before we got to Würzburg, you go up a long mountain. And uh, at the foot of that mountain, you had to, they sort of rebuilt the train and put a helper on the back end and a helper on the head end. It was a big struggle to get up that hill. But it was a long grade and took a lot of power. Now what kind of locomotives did you use there? All coal. Were they German or were they American? They're American, but some Germans too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we found it. They found a few good German train engines that they uh, fixed up and made them go and uh, look them over because they were booby trapped too. Some of them, you know. And uh, it was always a struggle to get up that long hill. I can remember going up there and looking down in the big valley and, and seeing all the flat land and, and 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 watching, not too far away, the women with Sias cutting, cutting the wheat or hay and there would be, there was two nuns with the, about seven women, two nuns with the Sias all in a row cutting by hand, cutting the hay or whatever it was, I don't know. Hmm. And then up at the top of this mountain, there's a tunnel about a mile long and we used to get, go through that every time you get up the top of the mountain and it had vents every, so many hundred feet, there would be a hole cut to vent the steam and the, and the smoke. And one time I went in that tunnel and there was a guy stalled in there, a train stalled in there, and nobody ever, I can't believe that they would let us go in that damn tunnel and, uh, and somebody stalled in there. Mm. But after working, pulling up a long grade, your engine is right on the money for steam power, you know, got 300 pounds pressure, and you got fresh coal in there. Soon we got in that tunnel and the guy stopped, you got to shut the engine off, and the minute you shut the engine off, the pop valve goes, the steam comes out in a tunnel, the awful steam pressure and the coal smoke, and in, in 10 seconds, you, you couldn't see nothing, just smoke and steam in the cab, the whole, the whole tunnel is full, you know, it just can't go anywhere. And you can't hear nothing, you can't see nothing, you couldn't even see the flashlight in front of you, and you can't breathe. Wow, and what are you going to do? Holy gee. So, my farmer and I, we knew that we, you can't see nothing. We got off the engine, got down on the ground, and we crawled, and we can't breathe because that's nothing but steam and smoke, and the noise is terrible. We crawled on our hands and knees and crawled and crawled for several hundred feet till we could get our nose to the ground and get a fresh air to, to live. Boy, it was awful. I thought, that's hell. If hell's like this, I've been there. Hmm. But after a while, it dissipated, and the guys went, and so we got out of there and went too. But gee, well, that was an awful thing to go through that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was no fun. But them poor prisoners. I mean, we had a train load of prisoners, taking them back. And, and uh, I always thought, gee, some of these prisoners were going through an area that is their hometown. You know, if I was in Watertown, if I was going through my hometown in the middle of the night, I would, I would slip off this old boxcar and they wouldn't see me and I'd be a hiding. And I, I said, if, if, if the shoe fits, if these guys can, can get off of this damn train, a prisoner, and go home, I say goodbye. <laughs> there ain't no glory in going to war, I tell you. I'm telling you, there ain't no fun going to war. See that.
Yeah. Yes, indeed. But all those displaced people, that I remember one time I was waiting to move out of a yard and there's so many people around. I looked over on the side and this mother had four children. And she must have found out that a certain train on a certain track was going where she wanted to go. So she took two of the kids and she, and she got through all these tracks with a couple of cars. She crawled over them and with some bags and she found a car and she put two kids in it with the bags and stuff. And she crawled back over the, the cars, you know, right in the trains, two or three trains just to get the other guys. While she's gone back to get the other guys, that train pulls out with her two kids in it. I don't know if she ever followed him again or not, but that's the way he was. It's awful. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Now, you mentioned uh, here that you received the African and Middle East Service Medal. Were you in the Middle East also? Middle East? Yes. No. Maybe it's just the European African. Yeah. Okay. No, I wasn't in the Middle East, no, but they gave us battle stars for, you know, the d different areas that we were they were fighting in. I think I got three I got the, the issued to me. Uh-huh. Yeah, George Patton. I saw him a couple of times before he got wounded and he died. Uh -huh. Yeah, blood and guts, Patton. My God. Yeah, and I had uh, General Bradley's little private train one time to haul him around, a nice little three-car train. That was kind of an honor. Mm -hmm. General Bradley. What did you think of him? Did you talk to him personally no, ever? Or no. no. What did you think of Patton? Well, uh, I got a picture of him way off. It was at a, it was at a European Theater track meet, ETO track meet, and, uh, and he was there, and it was in an open amphitheater in Germany. It was kind of a funny place to go, but we, I was impressed to see Moroccan sprinters, you know, they were these Moroccan uh, soldiers and troops, and little guys weighed about 118, and they could run fast as a deer. I couldn't believe that a human being could run like the old guys. They, they could sprint like you couldn't believe how they'd take off and run. It was something. I enjoyed that. Yeah, that's where old Patton was. I got a picture of him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you ever get to see any USO shows? Oh yes, oh yes. <laughs> I saw Mickey Mickey Rooney and and that Bartholomew guy and yes, we had a few. And then uh, I was going to say we went to the dances at the USO at Nancy, France, at Nancy. And uh, Bob Monroe was playing there, and uh, that was kind of nice. Hmm. And uh, later in life, uh, we had a cottage at Point Vivian, and this. John Turnbull, he he was visiting his sister there, and he played the saxophone, and he was so good. And I, I told, and he was he played in Von Monroe's band, and he was there when I was there. This man that came up, and he's still playing. Fly me to the moon, <laughs> lovely. Yeah, we'd go there, and they had a few of them girls that waited on table around, and they spoke pretty good English. So it was kind of nice to wait and find a girl that could talk English to dance with. So I had my eye on this one from Lithuania. She she was, I, I she had funny gray eyes like a sheep. I call them bedroom eyes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, everybody liked to dance with her, so I got my chance to dance with her. But I noticed the guys didn't dance with her very long. But anyway, when I got my chance to dance with her, holy mackerel, there's just a minute, Joe. Open your mouth for a conversation. She was so full of garlic that she blasted you right off. <laughs> that was her first line of defense. That garlic. She ate that garlic, so them GIs didn't bother her a hell of a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that was the whole story. Boy. Now, were you married while you were in? Uh... Yeah, I was married in '42. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and my wife died in uh, 2000. So we had almost 58 years, my gosh. So you sent a lot of letters and, and the photographs back home to her? Then? Oh yeah, I wrote, I had my stuff on the engine. I wrote every week, I mailed a letter every week and those pictures, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh-huh. 
While you were uh, over in Europe, do you uh, recall hearing about the death of President Roosevelt and your reaction? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. What was your reaction to well, that? Well, gee, yes. I remember. I remember I was in that school there at, uh, from, in Hanau. Yeah, I remember that. Gee, it was a sorrowful thing, yeah. But the war didn't go until August 8th or so. It was all done then. And then we, the engineers had to ride the, the head end. The engineers had to ride the, when the German civilians took over the railroad. We had to continue riding the head end to see that they didn't goof off and didn't go the right way. And the mm -hmm. co conductor had to ride the tail end. Uh huh. So that was uh, the, the Frenchmen. We didn't. Have, they, we trusted them to do their own thing, but we had to watch the Germans for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. and then the war. We were waiting to come home. When did you go home? Gee, uh, I got out. I. We we, we went from the down to Marseille on the Mediterranean to leave and we were down there a week or so and the ship was getting loaded up about the 28th and 9th of December we were going to leave and I think it was the first day of January they were all ready to leave and the old tugboats the, the, the port of Marseille was all uh, uh, cement, cement uh, bunkers, you know, the Germans had fortified it to protect the harbor, and it was all German built up for, for protection. But anyway, there was a big old wharf there, a cement wharf, and two tugboats got a hold of the old uh, ship to pull it away to leave, and the wind was blowing hard, and uh, they had these old hawser lines that were three inches, four inches, big ropes I ever saw, and they were pulling, the, pulling it away from the wharf. And the wind, the hawser line broke, and the ship went back against the wharf and put some holes in the side. It, mm. it, 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 it crippled the ship so we couldn't go. So we had a battalion of men on board that were working the shop. We had our own shop battalion that repaired the engines, and there were boilermakers and welders. So they agreed to repair it if they could find the material and they floated a barge and they welded for about 18, 20 hours. They welded and welded plate and they got it inspected and we, we got to come home and that was a happy thing. Mm -hmm. I saw the Mediterranean right in the middle of winter and it was a beautiful blue Mediterranean and yeah, Gibraltar, yes. I wasn't seasick coming home. Boy, I'm coming home, I'm riding high. Boy, I tell you, I didn't get sick. <laughs> It was a great day getting out of that army with your A bag and your B bag. I dreamed it over and over and over. My God, yes. Yeah. Did you uh, join any veterans organizations when you... Yeah, I did for a while, but you know, on the railroad, I never could get home to the meetings, and I was on a call a lot, and I, I, I did for several years. But so I, you worked on the railroads when you returned home? Oh, yeah. I worked 35 years, yeah. Who did I, you work for? Oh, well, New York Central and the Penn Central. I, re I worked 35 years. I worked 35 years. And I've got a stack of time books. Every day I worked, I kept track of the, the day I worked and the, who I worked with, the number of the engine, how much I made. And I got every day, I got a stack of time books for 35 years. Every day I worked and who I worked with, how much I made. <laughs> when I started working, I got $6.35 a day for a shovel of coal. And I've been retired 28 years. Wow. 28 years I've been retired. 1975. Oh, Did you ever stay in contact with anyone that you served with? Oh, yeah. We had a lot of good reunions. Every couple of years I got pictures of the nice reunions mm -hmm. we had. And, uh -huh. Do you oh, have, yeah. Are you in contact with anyone no, I haven't. Been, not lately. I since my mother, my wife had Alzheimer's and I for twelve years and, and and I had I couldn't I wanted to but they had they had a, every year they'd have a reunion in a certain part of the country that was nice to go but we went to Chicago and we went to Richmond and Atlanta but then we didn't go much more but it was fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. all okay. railroad guys and I have a few close by where we keep in contact Governor and that we we talk to them We've got pictures. Did you want to show us a few pictures? Yes. Well, maybe we could show those first. Okay. Okay, now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, th this it might is... be easier if you, if you could sit down. Okay. Uh -huh. right. You can explain, explain each one. Uh, well, that, that is just a picture of a, 
some heavy shells, and I wonder what kind of guns they put them in because they look awful heavy. And to me, and for guys to be handling one to get loaded up, they must have a pretty good muscle. And that is a nice German uh, locomotive that uh, it was operative, and uh, they had to check it out for a booby trap. Now that's that's yeah. you in the is window. That you in the window of the. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is one of the GI engines. They're all about the same, and they had a vacuum brake, they had a steam brake, they had an air brake. And, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's just a pile of rubble. There's all kinds of rubble, and that picture, I guess, is where the German ammunition train blew up. And I'm glad I wasn't there. Okay. And uh, over here is a a picture of. Uh, People riding on top of the coal cars, there's probably a, a, several hundred people on that train just riding day and night, just sit up there in the rain and ride on the coal pile. And there's a nice, well-dressed people with all their baggage. Yes, and these are buddies of mine that, uh, that uh, and this is a picture of Verdun, where, where the First World War was fought around Verdun oh, yeah. and Barley Duke. And I remember going around a sizable hill that is made over into a park or a museum where the First World War veterans were dug in and the trenches are still there and quite obvious from 1919, 1918. Mm -hmm. And they sort of made a preserve out of it because I guess maybe the, the land is full of shells and exposed stuff or whatever. Yeah, and there was, I had a lot of pictures that I went to the, villages and took pictures of the horse fairs and the people didn't have any any conveniences then of automobiles left over they used, and they used horsepower and, and even cattle and oxen. Now what about that engine over there? Well that was a French engine that they had for their passenger equipment and mm -hmm. it was a it had high wheels like we call them a high wheeler they go fast but uh, they were no good for, for us to use because they didn't, they were just made to haul a, a small train fast. They were good fast train. They had a good railroad. For you? Uh-huh. Okay, uh -huh. and you've got some oh, pictures in your album. Well, why do I, what can I get out of that? Well, why don't you show us you and, now that was your wife you yeah. married while you were in service. Yeah, well, okay. Okay, uh, yeah, if you could, you don't have to pull them out, you can just hold the, uh, the album up. <laughs> you want to see that one, huh? Sure. Okay, well, that's my Margaret. I, she was an old-fashioned girl, and she saved a lot of money for you. <laughs> uh, now, could, if you could sit down, it, I, can, I can focus in on it easier. Okay. Imagine that. Now, uh, when did you get married? Oh, October 20th, 1942. Then I went in the war in '43, and well, I got home in '46, and we we had three three daughters and a son. They were four of them born in six years, so that was that. Yeah, and I have a, my youngest daughter is a lieutenant colonel in the reserves. So. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the old swastika there that they. Yeah, and I made a lot of good friends. Yeah, this girl, the beard, the guy from Oswego. She was a pretty girl, and uh, I went back to visit them, and her mother asked me if, it would, if she wanted my permission to, to see if it would be all right for her to marry this guy. And I said, I don't know this guy, and I don't know what, what I give you permission. <laughs> but uh, that's the way it was. Yeah, went to lots of churches over there in Paris around. I, I, was, a, I was still a church goer. Our uh, army officers were railroad men that work on the railroad and the, I always say they were plain old tobacco chewing, poker playing good men. When, when we had a little poker game they wanted to be right in on it. They were our officers, you know. They they didn't they wear their hat on the back of their head and they they come and might as well have a little fun. They were they was okay. Oh yeah, we used to get around to the wine cars. We, every once in a while you'd find a wine car and it would be loaded with wine. So you know what the guys would do? They take their 45 and shoot a hole in it. <laughs>
they shoot a little hole in it and then they fill up them jerry cans with wine and they plug up the hole and later they go back and shoot another hole lower <laughs> so they could empty the car by <laughs> uh, yeah. well there's some of the equipment that they use yeah and uh, I've seen lots of uh, tracer bullets in the, in the aircraft shooting at them planes at night time and all them tracer bullets going up. That's something to watch. And, uh, yeah, they had lots of horses over there and they used them for, for everything. And they had funny old engines over there that had uh, no tender, but they carried the water on a saddle on the side of the engine and and a uh, little bit of coal, and they were shunting around pretty good. Yep. Okay. Wow, I've got a lot of pictures. There's, there's the first colored pictures way, way back in 43, the coat of color. They didn't come out like they you know them. Were, I had to send those home, but they, they kind of different than now. That's the first coat of color pictures. Now you said that at one time while you were in Europe, you uh, there were black troops near you. Yes. Uh, what what did they do? Uh, they were took care of the unloading the bulk tanks of uh, fuel, mm -hmm. diesel, oil, and gasoline, and uh, and, and fit it, fitting it uh, ready for transportation in small cans. Mm -hmm. And we were. My friend Hintz and I, we stayed with this French lady for a couple of months, not even that long, a month I guess, and uh, we were sort of checking the cars in and out. That was in France. Yeah, and I'm going to tell you about this time we had a uh, bunch of uh, uh, flat cars with the troops riding their tanks. They, they were they moving an outfit of 10 or 15 cars and they were they had the tanks loaded on the cars, and, the, and the, the guys that run the tanks, they were riding up on the top of each uh, tank, and we changed route. We went, to, we went to this little village and turned off to another line, and we had only gone a short ways when uh, it started to rain. And evidently, we come up under electri electrified wires that uh, was the first we ever knew that they had quite a bit of electric electrified power but they, we never saw any use any but mm -hmm. this this wire over the line was 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 energized and we were just traveling along slowly and all of a sudden they stopped the train something else stopped the train and and there were guys that were riding on top of the box car or the the tanks they they come within 18 20 inches of that hot wire in the rain and it electrocuted about 12 of them wow. riding on top of there and they stopped and took them off and they were electric they got electrocuted riding on them cars because of the rain and the power hmm. boy it was awful hmm. yeah now did you want to show us this this was that the hat oh. you wore and <laughs> oh yeah right I don't know. my head it's well maybe my head is swell but I don't know <laughs> <laughs> now, what is that? Uh, oh, that's something I stuck on there. It's something. It's got a Fr Latin meaning on it. I can't quite decipher it. Mm -hmm. If it was French, I could do it. <laughs> um, now, that's your unit's uh, yeah. distinctive. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. Well, we got insignias. Oh, you can look at my money stuff. Oh my God, yes, I got GI money here. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's some money that I brought sent back, and the dates on it now. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. No, that's money from different countries and that's what the GI issue one mark that's that's American issue yeah and there's 10 francs that's American issue and these are German Belgian mm -hmm. yeah you got a lot of money here yeah how about that yeah here's the old hash mark and the Yep. When you got out of the army, they give you that, and we call it the lame, the lame duck. You put the, that right. Or the there. ruptured the, duck. The ruptured duck. <laughs> that, do you still get that? No, they don't give those out anymore. Well, that's what we had on our sleeve right there at transportation. There was a presidential citation. That was a T four, T three, technical sergeant. Got about $40 a month. 
Yep, there's one of our reunions. Yep. There's the discharge. And, mm -hmm. Yep. But there, there's that topographical map that takes you up and down the. Oh boy, I wore that right off. Look at that. Look at that. 84 miles of hills and dales. Hold it up a little bit so the camera <laughs> can pick it up. Now they, they gave you that map to show you that the That was the first thing I got the first night I went out. Yeah, it goes 84 miles and it tells you the elevation up and down the hills and the distance between the villages. And you go through a village and never knew it. There was no sign of it, you wouldn't see no lights, and you never know there was a village. Hmm. Yeah. Sure enough. Well, isn't that funny? I don't know why I brought them home, but here they are oh. after all that year. Yeah. 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 Okay. And there's a picture of the, 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 the company made a little paper that they give us the news I'm on with a yeah, chaplain's corner and entertainment program. And this was in Germany. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview. Yes, thank you. It was very interesting. Well, it was okay, huh? Yes, sir. Well, Here, don't forget this. You won't find too many guys that'll have all this junk. <laughs>